Excellent. I will get started. So hello, everyone. Um, I am Era Buffer Overflow, or Buffy for short, um, and I'm broadcasting live from the stolen lands of the Wadawurrung and Jarjarwurrung people of the Western Kulin Nation. And before I get started today, I want to acknowledge the sovereignty of these lands was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So to tell you a bit more about myself, I'm a security engineer by day and by night, one of my hobbies is lock sport. And that's basically an umbrella term for the sport or recreation of defeating locking systems. Lock sport covers a lot of different skills and areas, but today we'll be taking a look back at a few lock picking mini games from the past 20 years and analyzing what they did well and where they got some of the details wrong and how you can improve your own lock picking mini games in the process. So how do we know a good lock picking mini game from a bad one? Well, luckily over the past three weeks, I've been perfecting my five point rating system, which is pretty straightforward. So a hundred points will be awarded for an accurate depiction of the external lock. 100 points will be awarded for an accurate depiction of the lock internals. 200 points will be awarded for an accurate depiction of lock picking tools. And 100 points will be awarded for having an interesting or accurate gameplay mechanic. So let's get into it. The first game we'll be looking at today is Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, a stealth based game developed by Ubisoft. And being a stealth shooter game, of course, it featured lockpicking. In the PC version of Splinter Cell, lockpicking is done by using the directional arrow keys to manipulate the lock. And while in the console version, lockpicking was done by rotating the left analog stick until the controller vibrated, which would indicate that the inner pin was locked into place. Once enough of the pins were set, the door would open. And while it's not a novel mechanic, in terms of gameplay and how it plays out on screen, it is pretty accurate. Externally as well, uh, the lock is pretty accurate. On the left, you can see what's considered a standard Lockwood door lock. And on the right is an image of one of the locks from the game. And as you can see, it's pretty, pretty detailed if you ask me. You can even see that they include the lock spindle, which is the bar that connects the knobs or the levers through the door and operates the actual locking mechanism. Now, when it comes to the lock internals, I'll be honest, uh, I originally scored this section a lot lower, but it wasn't until my upteenth time rewriting everything I noticed something really interesting. So let's take a quick dive into lock mechanics. If you're not familiar with pin tumbler locks, there are three key parts. You have the key pin or the bottom pin, which is what's actually touched by the key. Uh, and they come in a variety of sizes and that determines the different depths cut into your key. So when the correct key is inserted into the lock, the top of the key pins aligns and allows the key to rotate. So for example, in this short clip, we can see that all the red pins, which are represented uh, which represent the key pins get lifted up to align to the top of that light yellow section, which is what we refer to as the shear line. So you can see that when the, the lock gets put in, all of those red pins will align to the same height. And that's actually what allows you to open a lock with your key. So as I mentioned, all the key pins have to align to that shear line for the lock to open. If one pin is even a little bit higher or a little bit lower, the lock probably won't open. So in that example, you might have also noticed that we had some blue pins and those are what we call driver pins or top pins sometimes. And these are placed between the key pin and the spring. That way, when there is no key inserted into the lock, rotation of the plug is prevented, which stops the lock from fully opening. It's also important to note that in some key systems, it is possible to have different keys that open the same lock. And these are known as master systems and introduce third, fourth, and fifth spacing pins, but we won't be covering those sort of systems today. We also have the springs, which are placed above the pin stack and that creates tension. And the tension ensures that when no key or the incorrect key is inserted into the lock, the 
lock can't actually be open. And the tension generated by that spring also makes sure that the key pins don't get trapped above the shear line. So going back to our lock in splinter cell, we can clearly see that the key pins are in there. And while they are flat, which would render using a real key near impossible, we do have those pins rendered. But you might be asking, where are the driver pins? Well, in this image where I increased the clarity as much as I could, you can actually see them there. But because of the various shades of gray used to render the lock, they were originally somewhat difficult to see. But you might also notice that we still need to locate one more piece of the lock, and that's the springs. Um, and while we can see from the rendering there are no springs in the lock, uh, it would have actually rendered the lock very impractical. Uh, but considering the graphics capabilities of 2002, I definitely think that this is a detail that we can overlook. The last thing that we want to look at is the tools and how they're depicted. In this image of a lock from the game, we can see that there are two tools, which is always a good start because you normally use two tools in lock picking. Um, and we can also see that the tool used for, for picking the lock is really similar to a real life lock pick. Um, and this particular lock pick is called a hook pick. And it's a fairly common tool and it comes in most standard lock picking sets. And for comparison, that's what a real hook pick looks like. So we can see that, again, like really, really good attention to detail here. But then we have the inclusion of this second tool that spans the length of the keyway. And the rendering makes it look really, really wide in the bottom, um, wider than most tools that you'd encounter when lock picking, because even with standard locks, they don't provide a lot of space uh, in there to get extra tools in. Um, if you look at your average house key, you'll notice that that's only, you know, at most a couple of millimeters thick. And I think the developers were aiming to render a tension tool of some sort, but they really sort of missed the mark on this one. For comparison, tension tools, uh, which are normally made of spring steel and are quite short in the end that goes into the lock, um, they're only a millimeter or so high and at most about a mil or two thick. Uh, and you'll find that most of them are L-shaped. And there are also a lot of different variations that exist. And we'll cover that off a little bit later um, because you can also have improvised tension tools. So overall, how does the 2002 version of Splinter Cell score? Overall, we got a pretty solid depiction of lock externals. We could see when comparing the render with a real life lock, there was some solid attention to detail, but I do still have some questions about how wide that keyway is. In terms of lock internals, if they ever plan to remake or build off this mini game, uh, I would love to see them sharpen the rendering and make those key pins the right shape, which is arguably a small but common issue with lock picking game depictions. Um, I'd also hope that with today's rendering capabilities, we could include some springs there. Again, another really, really small detail, but really helps uh, contribute to the realism there. And overall, these small details don't necessarily detract from the fact that we can see a pretty good representation and obviously some research has been done. I do really have to commend the graphics team though for taking the time to render two lock picking tools, which isn't as common as you would think in media. Most depictions tend to use one um, and a bit of media magic to show lock picking. And I'm honestly not too sure if it's because not a lot of time has been invested in researching how lock picking works in real life, or if it's because people are worried that if they show how to accurately lock pick, they'll get sued for teaching people how to break into houses and things. Um, although really common misconception because lock picking is not that easy to pick up as a skill. Uh, but as we discussed, we only got one accurate tool out of the two, and that could easily be fixed by shortening the tool shown and using that L-shaped configuration instead. And that would significantly improve the overall depiction of the tools used. 
Finally, we have the mechanics of splinter cell, and these really shine a light on how single pin picking techniques are quite tedious. And while they are justifiably simplified, it really helps make apparent that lock picking and especially single pin picking is not actually as easy as a lot of people might think. A detail that I often see games like Splinter Cell miss though is that when you're picking locks you don't actually solve them in a linear order from back to front or front to back. It might feel that way when you're using a key but it's not actually the case. So having a mechanic that changes the order that different locks need to be picked in would be a really small but meaningful change. And the benefit being is that a mechanic like that could be bound to a difficulty level uh, or introduced in later gameplay once a lock picking mechanic is actually understood and being used by the player more frequently. So overall, I think Splinter Cell did a pretty solid uh, depiction for early 2000s. Um, and overall for me, it gets a four out of five rating. So next up, we're gonna check out a more recent game. And that's gonna be the fourth installment of the Thief series, a stealth game released in 2014 by Iron Storm. In this game, you play as Garrett, a master thief, and he goes about a series of missions, most of which are focused on stealing from the rich. And honestly, with a name like Thief, if there was no lock picking or safe cracking or anything to do with that, I'd be pretty disappointed. Um, but luckily there was. So in terms of mechanics, I actually really enjoyed this game because unlike other mini games uh, where you were just sort of presented with lock internals, you had two ways to tackle lock picking. And the first mechanic, which we saw in the previous slide, involved you needing to purchase focus points to upgrade your dexterity so you could see into the lock and pick the lock using mechanics very similar to that of Splinter Cell. But even without the dexterity and focus upgrades, you were able to do lock picking, albeit it was a little bit harder. Um, but I like that, much like in real life, as you improved your dexterity, dexterity skills, lock picking became easier. So while improved dexterity in real life doesn't give you x-ray eyes, it does work really well as a mechanic. And so when we turn our focus to how the locks are shown externally, we can see that there's a really strong resemblance to a real life warded lock. And Warded locks work by introducing gates or le levers that need to be lifted to a specific height by a key in order for the locking bolt to move. And once the gates have been moved to the correct height, rotating the key then activates the lever or a sliding bolt and that opens the lock. And this would actually have been a really common locking mechanism considering Thief was set in this time that resembled a cross between the late Middle Ages and the Victorian era. Except when we use our focus and we see the lock internals, it's actually not a lever lock at all. It's a pin tumbler lock, like most other locks in video games. Um, and it looks like the, the lock that we saw in Splinter Cell. And we know pin tumbler locks use a very different mechanic. And we can also see that when comparing the lock from Thief to our real-life depiction, the pin configuration is also wrong. As we saw in the first section, key pins are normally various lengths, and that's something that we can see that they got right, but the pins aren't pointed at the bottom to match the hills and valleys of a key, and again, that would render any real-life key useless because with square pins and pointed keys, uh, everything would just get jammed and it wouldn't actually work. But then when we have a look at the driver pins, which are at the top, they are pointed and it's almost like they're shaped to match the hills and valleys of a key. So it looks like someone has accidentally just got their pins mixed up uh, in the way that they're ordered. But on the upside, we do have springs this time. So as tool depictions, go. Um, I actually think that this is where Thief really does an excellent job um, compared to most video games because we can see in this still where Garrett isn't using that focus to look into the lock, 
He has a tension wrench and he has a lock pick. So again, we have two tools, which is an amazing start. And it's really subtle. Oh, sorry. It's really subtle, but they take on the right shape and the movements, while a little bit over-exaggerated, aren't wrong. Thief also goes to the effort of giving the user a selection of two different lock picks. And while that's not an awful, uh, uh, an awful amount of lock picks to, to pick from, compared to other mini games where the user is only given one, um, it's a really neat inclusion, like just the fact that you have two options to pick from. And the best part about this uh, is that in some cases, if the lock didn't open with the use of one pick, you would need to switch the tool that you're using. And that's something that you sometimes need to do when you're lock picking. And sometimes even if you've used the second pick in the game, you need to switch back to the first one again. And again, while this isn't a perfect reflection of real life, this is one of those really small details that makes it feel like someone really went to the effort to understand how lock picking works and to try and depict that as accurately as they could. And so on that topic of lock picking tools, um, when we talk about pin tumbler picking, which is the sort of locks that we've been looking at so far, there are two fundamental ways of picking them. We have single pin picking, which is where you try and set each pin individually, which is the normal mechanic you see in mini games like Splinter Cell and Thief. And we also have the ability to do raking. And much like when raking soil or leaves, you basically pull a pick over the pins multiple times and see what sets. And both of these styles require different techniques that are matched with an ideal pick shape. And that means that there's only about six fundamental designs of lock pick, but there are a lot of different variations on top of that, um, especially when you're talking about handles, the, the type of uh, material that they're made out of, and there can also be a lot of subtle differences in the shapes of the picks themselves. But before I walk through these different types of picks in more detail, it's really important to remember that there are no enforced rules when you're lock picking. It's just good basics and understanding how to use your tools effectively. So the first one we have, and this is the, the sort of pick that you see in a lot of games, is the short hook pick. And it's really helpful for single pin picking, but it can also be really good for raking. It's considered a good overall pick and is relatively agile and maneuverable, but it can be difficult to use if you have very deep valleys in front of sh very short valleys, and that's because of the radical pin heights. In comparison, the long hook pick is also good for single pin picking, but isn't as good for raking. The benefit of a pick like this is that it does a better job of maneuvering those uh, really high pins compared to those really short ones. And that was something that that short hook pick struggled with. But because these picks tend to be longer in the tip, you can sometimes struggle to fit them into smaller keyways. Then we have the half diamond pick, and this provides a lot of the benefits of the short hook in that it's small, maneuverable, and good for raking. But half diamonds also provide more control when lifting and lowering pins. And in part, that's because it's shaped similar to a hill on a key. And that allows the picker to quickly locate and set pins in a more, I would describe it as a natural way. I find um, half diamond picks a little bit easier to use than hook picks and they don't get jammed as often between pins. It does tend to be wider though and can sometimes be clunky and a little bit harder to maneuver in small locks. And so it makes it less desirable as like an all rounder pick. We also have this half ball pick and it looks like they'd be very similar in comparison to the half diamond, uh, but it's not actually as effective at picking pins in pin tumbler locks. It's actually better for what we refer to as wafer locks and we'll see why a little bit later on. Um, we do also have uh, these full ball picks and again, they're more beneficial for opening wafer locks than the pin tumbler locks that we've seen. And 
part of the reason of that is because the round shape of the pick allows easier navigation uh, because wafers are square in shape and it makes it easier to avoid jamming the pick in between the wafers uh, than more like polygon shaped tools. So like the hooks and the, the half diamonds. So unless you're specifically including wafer locks in your game, you probably don't even need to depict uh, moon style picks like this. We're now going to take a look at some of the raking tools. And as I mentioned, these are designed to rake pins by rapidly sliding the pick past all of the pins repeatedly to bounce them until they reach that shear line. And first up, we have the snake rake, which is considered one of the oldest style of rake. And because it has these two tiny peaks of different height, um, and it's quite small when compared to other similar tools, it makes for a more agile and maneuverable lockpick, which is quite desirable, as you've probably worked out from the amount of times I've said agile and maneuverable. And because of the compact size and the short configuration, it's really hand handy when dealing with random or radical pin heights. We also have the city rake so named for its resemblance to city skylines. And I guess I can see the, the resemblance there. But you might also notice that the city rake looks similar to your actual key. And unlike other rakes, we don't use this pick in a dragging fashion. Um, instead, we sort of use it in a rocking motion. And that helps ensure that the different peaks of the rake have a chance to touch and set all of the different pins in a lock. But this also makes this type of rake ineffective against locks with uh, better machining, where the pins are set in a more precise manner and smaller keyways just because you can't actually fit it in there. And the last pick that we have today is the battering, which is made for zipping. And that's a similar, very tech, uh, it's a technique, very similar to raking. Um, and because of its design, it has these two peaks and it gives you two chances to sort of set each pin per zip and each pick is radically sharp so then it can violently throw pins to the shear line rather than sort of moving them more gently which is the way normal rakes will do it. But these picks can also be delicate and so they are more likely to snap uh, at the rake where it meets the handle. And so they're not very helpful against narrow keyways or radical pin heights where you're more likely to get very um, rough motion or basically just where you're going to be a bit more aggressive with the pick itself. And you might be noticing we haven't actually spoken about this tool yet, and that's because it's not actually a lock pick, even though it might look like one. And if you ever look at a lot of stock videos for lock picking, this is one of the most common tools that you see them using. Uh, it's actually a key extractor. And as the name suggests, it's used for pulling broken keys out of locks. And we can distinguish this type of tool from something like the half diamond pick, as it has this very tiny hook on the end, which is used to hook onto the valley of the key. So then you're able to pull it out. We also have the tension tools uh, up the top, which we spoke about at the very start. So in this section, we had a look at the fourth installment of the Thief series, so titled Thief. Uh, it was a stealth game released in 2014 by Ironstorm. We also talked about the different types of tools available to lock pickers and their general purpose in picking locks. So how does Thief stack up to other games that we've looked at so far. So we covered off how externally the lock resembled a warded lock, which lines up pretty well with the theme of Thief, which was set in an era that resembled a cross between the late Middle Ages and the Victorian era. But as we saw, this didn't actually match the lock internals. And so in that regard, I'm going to actually award this depiction of the external lock as zero. In contrast, the lock internals were relatively accurate. We could clearly see the key and driver pins, and we even got springs this time. Hooray! Um, however, because the depiction of the key and the driver pins was the wrong way around, I'm only actually going to award half the points. So it gets 50 out of 100 instead. And as we saw, Garrett is depicted using a tension wrench and a lockpick, and how he used them is actually pretty accurate. 
We also covered how the user had, albeit a small selection of lockpicks, there was a selection, and that isn't super common in games that include lockpicking mechanics. In Thief's case, this mechanic was used to add a layer of complexity to lockpicking, and after going through all the different lockpicks, you could probably see that in real life we have more of a variety of options. And so when implemented as a game mechanic, making lockpicking minigames not only more realistic in their depiction, uh, but it can also be used to increase or decrease difficulty that the player faces, which would allow us to either tailor the difficulty to the mechanic overall, uh, so giving users more casual difficulty access to tools like rakes, or you could also make tools that make lockpicking easier, more expensive or rare, um, especially if you're using things like shop mechanics or if you're using um, searching for tools and things like that. Having a wider selection also allows you to very easily tailor that difficulty, especially in later gameplay where, you know, the, the player has probably experienced lockpicking a dozen times and it just gives it a little bit of a breath of fresh air, I guess. And finally, we saw how Thief had two ways of interacting with locks, either using a mechanic that allowed the user to try and pick the lock without much visual feedback, or by leveling up their dexterity and using focus, we could easily see into the lock, which allowed you to pick the pins more easily. And this, as I mentioned earlier, made the game much more interesting in its depiction of lock picking, but also did a really good job of reflecting uh, in one of the few ways a game can, the difference between someone who hasn't skilled up their lock picking skills and dexterity in comparison to someone who hasn't. So overall, uh, I actually thought this game was pretty good. Um, there were obviously some minor areas of improvement, um, ensuring consistency between internal and external renderings, which I think is one of those small bugbears a lot of lockpickers tend to have in the same way that like some developers have bugbears around programming being depicted as scrolling HTML text or hackers rolling their eyes at the stere stereotypical like pew pew screens. Um, so overall, this game got uh, three and a half picks out of me. And next up, we have Fallout 4, which was developed by Bethesda and released in 2015. Um, for people who aren't as much into stealth games, I think Fallout 4 helped bring lockpicking into the forefront of, of a lot of gamers' minds, especially because it posed the question of, can I open a lock with a screwdriver and a bobby pin? And I honestly didn't find the mechanics of Fallout 4 as interesting as many of the other games, mainly because it primarily involved you negotiating the placement and rotation of a screwdriver and a bobby pin. Um, and it's something that I honestly struggled with, not to mention the fact that 12 years ago when I played Fallout 4 for the first time, I was killed by the rat things at the very start, and it sort of ended my friendship with Fallout Forever. But I think part of the issue is that if you were picking a lock like this with a screwdriver and a bobby pin, it's probably one of the most inefficient ways to do it, but we'll get to that in a moment. First, I want to talk to you about the external rendering, which from the outside is actually really, really good. Um, it's really similar to a wafer lock of some sort, and on the left you can see a real wafer lock, and on the right you can see a close-up from Fallout. So overall, fantastic uh, attention to detail, and also the uh, rendering of the bobby pin and screwdriver is just really, really good. And before we keep going on uh, a quick detour into how wafer locks work, and it's somewhat similar to pin tumbler locks that we saw in the first two sections. Without a key in the lock, the wafers, which are red, are pushed down by springs, and they nestle into a groove in the lower part of the outer cylinder, which is the green part, and that prevents the plug, which is yellow, from rotating. And when the correct key is inserted, the wafers are raised out of the lower groove into the outer cylinder, but not so high as they enter that upper groove. And with the wafers unobstructed, the key, wafer, and plug can rotate. 
And you can sort of see by looking at this depiction here, why having a round pick would be a lot more effective than having a hook or a diamond here because as you can see there are these little gaps in between each of the pins and that's where polygon shaped tools tend to get stuck. Um, so having that round shape keeps them out of those little wedges there. So if we take another look at how the locks in Fallout are being picked, we can see that the screwdriver is being used to create tension, like our tension tools would. And while I assume the unrigid side of the uh, the rigid side of the uh, the unrigid side of the bobby pin is being used to pick the lock, what is unusual about that depiction is part of the negotiation between the bobby pin and the screwdriver. Um, puts the bobby pin into the left or right hand side of the lock and if we go back to our picture uh, there isn't really a mechanic here that would benefit from having or being picked from the left or right hand side you would only go up or down but in comparison to the example um, we know that there is no mechanic in real lock picking that would benefit from that sideways manipulation uh, unless you're doing dimple picks uh, dimple locks but we aren't talking about those today all that aside if you're able to find a bobby pin with that little plastic cover still intact or a rounded edge still attached it would actually make for a pretty good makeshift lock pick uh, because like that full and half moon pick we saw before they are less likely to get caught on those wafers but you might still be wondering what other items can we use to open locks with and the answer does sort of depend on the type of lock you have and what household items you have on hand um, but we can actually use paper clips this is a really quick and easy way to make lock picks and tension tools. Um, they're not overly effective because um, they are so soft and malleable, but by following the basic patterns of common picks that we saw earlier, you can fashion yourself some improvised um, hook and rake type of picks. And so the reality is that the most limiting factor of making reasonably good paperclip based lock picks is that most paper clips are made from steel wire and they're quite malleable so you may find that you need to reshape your picks after some use and you can like double fold all of the steel wire uh, and that can make it more rigid but without a good set of pliers on hand you can incidentally turn like a one millimeter paper clip into a three to four millimeter lock pick or tension tool and depending on the type of lock that you're trying to pick, that can actually be too wide and just cause more issues. Um, you will also find that using that tool uh, and warming it up will uh, encourage the manipulation of the wire. And without reinforcing it, um, you will find that it changes shape over time. It will snap, it might jam, and it might also stab you. Uh, a couple of days ago I was making some paperclip based lock picks and I basically cut up my hands and so now whenever I'm juicing a lemon I recall that scenario and it's just it's wonderful to be reminded of how much lock lock picking loves me. We can also make uh, lock picks and tools out of bobby pins and these can be more effective than paper clips, especially because the, the tips are plastic coated and with a little bit of work, they can be used to make simple hook picks. Uh, bobby pins though do suffer a different issue to paper clips in that they are made of steel, so they aren't as malleable. And so it does make them less likely to bend and snap in the same way paper clips do. It does also mean that they're harder to shape without having like a good set of pliers. Again, uh, bending them with your hand can be just painful and annoying. Um, you will also find yourself somewhat limited by the thickness and width of the different bobby pins that you select. Um, so 
Many common bobby pins are about 0.5 millimeters wide and they can actually be really good for those narrow keyways. Um, but if you're getting anything sort of thicker, you will start to run into issues in um, better quality locks, basically. In comparison um, to the other like common type of bobby pin uh, or hairpin, which is more often used to keep like hair in place. So they're smaller in diameter, normally about 0.15 millimeters. They also aren't as rigid as normal bobby pins, but they are uh, more rigid than paper clips. And so even though they have that low rigidity, it does mean that they're more susceptible to flexing when loaded with even small amounts of pressure. And this conceivably makes them better lock picks when dealing with narrow keyways, but because of that smaller diameter and that flex, uh, it does mean that they can be harder to maintain your grip and dexterity if you haven't reinforced it. But as we've talked about, double folding some of these things to remove some of that uh, flexibility uh, can introduce additional bulk in the same way we saw with paper clips and depending on the type of lock you're trying to pick, that can be an issue. And obviously we're like moving down the list of the wildest things that you can make lock picking tools out of. And you obviously get to a point where you hit pens and it's like, can you make a lock pick out of a pen? And the answer is sort of. Um, to make a lock pick out of a pen, first you'd wanna have a decent quality pen, not like a plastic one, but something that has a flat metal clip on it. Uh, the really good ones is the Uniball eye pens. And they're really good because they have these like really flat, well-polished metal clips on them and they're really rigid. And so they make uh, really hardy tension tools. Uh, but obviously because they are really rigid, you do need a good pair of pliers to bend them into that L shape. The other issue with them is coming in at about five millimeters wide, the Uniball eye pen clips can be too wide for a lot of conventional locks. Uh, so unless you have access to uh, machines that can narrow that down, you might find that they're a little bit hard to use. But even if you have access to like those uh, Quest Hotel pens, they have like a little bit of metal that you can probably fashion in um, into a temporary tension tool. And moving further down the list of absurd things that we can make lock picking tools out of, you can also use a electric toothbrush. Um, Jolly Peanut on YouTube has made a short clip of how to make a simple electric toothbrush lock picking tool. Uh, and it was successful at defeating a defiant deadbolt exterior door lock. And let me see if I can get this video to work because Oh no, I'm not too sure why the video is not working, but I will make sure to send the link in the Discord channel so people can watch this in their own time. Um, but basically what Jolly Peanut did was uh, he used the tension tool and then he used the electric toothbrush, like taking the head off it and then um, removing some of the further down plastic that way it had access more to that metal bar that sort of sits in the electric toothbrush and shakes up and down. And it actually uses the same mechanic as lock picking guns. Um, and they basically use the laws of physics to momentarily burst all of the driver pins out of the lock cylinder without sending the bottom pins up into it. So they basically just like hit them quite hard and then uh, the energy transfers through the bottom pin, pushes up the bottom pins. And then um, I'm not too sure if you can see, but he has a, a tension tool in his hand here and he's applying just a small amount of tension to that lock. Uh, and basically what that does is like when using your normal key, it sets the tension on the lock, um, which means that when those driver pins uh, jump up into the top part, you can very quickly turn the lock and it should basically open because they've uh, bypassed that shear line um, and that allows the, the free rotation. So 
Electric toothbrushes, can we do it? Yes, we can. Just requires a little bit of engineering and probably a Dremel. Even your conventional windscreen wipers can be turned into lock picking tools. Um, as shown in this image uh, from Nigel Tolley's series on making your own tools on the tool.uk site, you can see that underneath the rubber used in um, windscreen wipers, there's this really nice piece of rigid metal. Um, the only downside to using windscreen wipers is that because of the size and thickness of it, you generally need to have this machine. So um, I think like if you know how to use a lathe, they can come in quite handy. You could probably also use like a conventional Dremel um, and that would basically allow you to turn a windscreen wiper also into a lockpick or a tension tool or whatever other tool that you wanted to make with it. And so 17 years later, it's hard to deny that Fallout's impact on lockpickers and gamers alike has been substantial. Not only did it spur a number of Fallout 4 lockpicking themed videos on YouTube, but going through the comments on many of these videos, you can see people inspired to learn more about lockpicking from Fallout 4. So how does it rank up against the likes of Splinter Cell and Thief? Like many of the games we've looked at, we got a pretty solid depiction of lock externals. And I always get a bit of a kick out of seeing different styles of locks in video games. Um, it's not very often that you see a lot of um, media depict anything other than pin tumbler locks. And that's no doubt because pin tumbler locks are so ubiquitous being on most houses and businesses. Uh, and it's nice to see designers take a crack at, at some of the other types of lock available. And we didn't actually get to see the internals of the lock in Fallout. And I actually think that's really disappointing because I think it's one of the few times I've had a chance to see a mini game implement an alternative to a pin tumbler lock. And it would have been really great to see someone like Bethesda see how far they could take it with something like that. Um, you know, as we've talked about, we have the moon style picks and, and being able to use something like that, or even trying to have users or players pick a wafer lock using a bobby pin. Um, I think that would have been a really, really fun and frustrating mini game to challenge players with, especially like at a much higher difficulty level. Um, alas, hopefully if they continue to make more Fallout games, we will get to see that one day. Um, or maybe they'll introduce it as a mechanic in Skyrim. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but as I mentioned, Fallout 4 really did sort of go an extra mile in making their depictions of lockpicking stand out uh, from a lot of the rest of media in general. And of course, the, the lockpicking here is no different. Um, opting to f they, they opted to focus on using non-standard tools and arguably tools that you are likely to find in a post-apocalyptic landscape but I don't know what that says about my house considering I can never actually find bobby pins and you know you see players with collections of hundreds of bobby pins in the game. But the reason that this dep depiction worked was because while it's impracti impractical and uncommon, it actually works. You can conceivably over a, open a wafer lock with a bobby pin and a screwdriver. And I think it's a good demonstration as to why knowing how the mechanics behind an activity is really important, even in mini games, because it allows you to take those depictions and those mechanics a step or two further than you normally see. And it makes for a much more memorable experience for your players. Honestly, though, um, the mechanics of Fallout 4 are my least favorite part considering how well the rest of the game was in terms of gameplay, attention to detail, having a mechanic that's basically rotate two tools until it clicks or the bobby pin breaks is super underwhelming, um, especially when you might want to go to such an effort to get higher perception. Um, and I think the lack of an interesting mechanic here is really uh, 
because they didn't do the depiction of the internal lock, which would have given them a lot more sort of space to work in. Um, like the idea that in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, we have vault tech assisted targeting system, but we don't have anything to make locks more interesting seems like a massive plot hole, if you ask me. Especially when Thief, which was set in a more Victorian hybrid era, let me focus so hard I developed X-ray vision for enough time to pick a lock. And so I'm only awarding Fallout 4's mechanic half points uh, just because, like, while it was realistic, it just wasn't interesting. It just didn't tick that box for me, really. And so considering one of the criteria couldn't be met, I'm not actually planning on penalizing Fallout 4, but having opted to scale their overall rating, it puts them sort of on par with Thief at about three and a half points, with which without the last criteria would be probably equivalent to four and a half points. I'm not very good at math. Please don't ratio that. And so we have covered a lot of ground today talking about how pin tumbler locks work, covering off common types of lock picks, and how you can fashion your own lock picks out of everyday household items, including your electric toothbrush. So before I leave you today, let's just really quickly recap the main takeaways. Renders are the first thing that we see and they are what we as players spend the most time looking at. And as we've highlighted, it's important to get them right. Um, the comparison I like to draw is imagine playing Grand Theft Auto or Driver and seeing that all the cars have square wheels. You'd probably be pretty confused about the whole thing and for the same reason, if you're looking to have a lock picking minigame, it's important to get the details right. And on the topic of renders, there's more than one way to render a lock and while we've covered uh, pin tumbler and wafer locks today, there are so many other styles to be aware of and the same goes for locking mechanisms. So don't feel limited by what you see on your front door or for sale in Bunnings. Australia has uh, an incredibly so, uh, small selection of styles of locks available, uh, but there are a lot of people in the US and Europe who are always posting videos uh, and breakdowns of all of the different types of locks. So if you're not able to purchase these locks and play with them yourself, there are plenty of resources online uh, to find how these locks work. And I cover a, a bunch of resources at the end that you'll be able to screenshot. One game that we didn't actually get to touch on um, as part of sort of locks, but puts on display how far we've come in terms of video game renders, engines, mechanics, and how these translate into reality is Sophie's Safe Cracking Simulator. And this game basically allowed you to crack a simulated safe using real techniques. Um, it was really, really popular amongst lock sport enthusiasts and people who did know how to crack safes uh, because it was so accurate. And I think this game is a really great example of something that allows you to explore the internal and external beauty of devices that are mainly appreciated for their practical and impractical security applications. And based on the type of lock and how we render it, we get to implement the mechanics that influence how players experience lock picking in video games. Even simple mechanics like being able to set individual pins can open up opportunities for skill-based mechanics or leveling. We were also able to see that providing multiple of avenues for users to interact with lock picking mechanics can give users or players more interesting and varied gameplay whether it be by giving the player the ability to focus so hard they can see through metal or introducing crafting mechanics that allow players to build lock picking tools out of toothbrushes. And that brings me to our last key takeaway, lock picking tools. Depending on the qualities and the themes of your game, allowing players to use household items as improvised tooling can uplift crafting mechanics or just make for a more memorable mini game. And diversifying tools available either through scavenging or purpose, uh, purchase can also allow you to scale the difficulty or provide players additional lockpicking perks.
Lock spore and lock picking in particular give you the ability to add an interesting scalable mechanic that challenges how your players interact with and navigate their virtual world. And so by exploring how lock picking works in real life, you have this amazing opportunity to pick up a new hobby, but also imbue your game, whether it be a post-apocalyptic first person shooter or a 2D dungeon crawler with a fun and dynamic game mechanic. I'm Error Buffer Overflow. This has been Picking Your Battles, How Lock Picking Works in Real Life and How to Make Your Mini Games More Realistic. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yay, thank you so much. That was super exciting. So the chat has been uh, blowing up with lots of people talking about locks. There are some terrible puns in there. Um, you should uh, go and have a look at it afterwards. But I do have a bunch of questions from the audience that I wanted to pass on to you. Um, yeah. So let's get started on them. So Hopefully them... my slides made a good impression. And for oh all God. of you who aren't aware, impressioning is another lock spot. And that's my favorite lock spot. So, haha. -ha. Sorry, Lily. <laughs> we... No, it's all, you're all good. We we wanted to know if um, key takeaways was also a pun. Uh, of course, I actually okay. had to turn. Right, I had to actually turn down the key and lock puns. So then, like you know, it was actually a, a more coherent talk. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, like the chat, the chat has been putting them all back in for you. So I hope you get a good, uh, a good look over that. Um, here are some questions from the audience. So first one, um, Ben has asked, have you ever needed to use your lockpicking skills in the real world in brackets for a legal purpose? I don't know if that means like, are you a lawyer or I assume? <laughs> um, no, I never have. And part of the reason that is, is because um, I'm not actually a very good lockpicker for one. Um, I am more uh, practical in making keys uh, using a file, but also... Uh, there is a common rule amongst lock pickers that you don't pick locks that you rely on. And part of the reason that is, is because if you aren't necessarily skilled enough, you can damage your lock um, and just cause undue wear to it. And so I am the sort of person that just calls my locksmith and then stands there and goes, oh yeah, what's that? Tell me more about that tool. And then you walk away with some professional knowledge. Cool. Um, okay. Do you reckon it is possible to um, accurately depict one of those monstyle wafer shaped locks? I can't remember. Did you cover that off? I know we talked about wafer somewhere, didn't we? Yes, we did. Um, I believe it was Fallout that would have had the wafer lock if I am. Um... Oh, wow. I had so many slides. This one, like that. You, you did so much talking. Amazing. <laughs> I, I do actually think that it is possible um, to render something like this. I do not believe it would be as easy as like a really standard pin tumbler lock. Um, but I think if you wanted to make lock picking or make wafer locks a key part of your game, um, you could definitely do it. A key part. Yes. <laughs> you would need to pinpoint the... Uh, the key Which areas that you want to depict, yeah. <laughs> I can do this all day, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but there are like, I, I think especially with like wafer locks, if you're doing this sort of uh, cutaway style here, you could probably like remove things like springs um, and simplify a lot of these mechanics. Um, like for example, this wafer lock depicts four pins. Um, you could reduce this down to three. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can keep things realistic, uh, but still bringing the overall message of we have taken the time to research this type of lock um, and we hope you enjoyed this mechanic, basically. Brilliant. Um, okay, we still have time for a couple more questions, which is good because I have Excellent. some. Um, so... Next one da, da, da. has, all right, Harry asks, has haptic feedback ever been done in lockpicking mini games that you know of uh, in a way that felt legit or is it kind of phony? I've only ever really experienced like the haptic feedback 
in the video game controllers and I'm not as great with the like hand-eye coordination with the like controllers. Um, when I have seen it done or when I've experienced it, uh, it tends to be, I don't want to say phony, but um, it's probably not done in a way that depicts any sort of meaningful mapping to in real life lock picking. And that's because like once you get to that level of lock picking, you really are looking for these teeny tiny subtle feelings that you just, you can't emulate that in a meaningful way with a rumble pack. Um, it's either like sort of on or off or high or low, and you can't really get that um, that feedback system going. But I don't think that's a detriment. I think like in Splinter Cell, uh, there was like this rumble feeling that you would get when the when the lock was set, and I think that was fine. Like for me, that didn't actually detract from how the lock worked. It was just this is how I can get feedback about where I am in this sort of mini game basically yeah no that's that's cool um all right next question we do have quite a few um <laughs> do you have a favorite lock in real life and uh what makes it special to you if you do i do have i have like two special locks um i have like it's not a specific lock it is a series of locks uh and it is an abc c 83 I want to say it's been a while um and the reason that those locks are special to me is because that they are used in the European impressioning competitions and they are very hard to get in Australia so I have like a small collection of them that I hold on to for dear life they are all labeled with my name so I know if like if I ever go to a conference or a meetup and um someone takes these they're going to have locks that have my name on them basically so you don't get too far. Um, and then no I do have, no crimes, no crimes here. Um, and then I do have like a old and, older style, uh, like bolt lock. I'm not too sure exactly, but it has a, uh, it has a key and it has four sides to it. Um, and you like put it in and these two little bolts come out. And I really like that because that was a gift from one of my friends in Europe. And so I'm going to get those framed one day so then I can have them on my wall and show them off. Oh, <laughs> good. Um, okay. We do have, we still have more questions and we do have a little bit more time. Um, so I'm just going to keep asking them if that's okay with you. Yeah. Happy to, happy to answer more key questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Do you think that games will start to represent novel lockpicks like Lishi picks, or do you think that in people's minds a more traditional lockpick tool is still is easier for the people playing the game to imagine? I think normal lockpicks are easier for people to imagine. Um, I also have a feeling, and this is more of an this is an opinion. I think that if normal people found out things like Lishi picks existed, it might break their brains like to know that you can just go and buy these tools online and then open like doors um and the same goes can, for decoders i think yes can you describe what alicia pick is uh i i feel like i would be doing it a disservice because i've only really ever played with two or three of them but basically like they just allow you to pick locks really easily. They were originally made, uh, if I recall correctly, for cars. And so you would have one leashy pick per car lock and you'd need to buy like a whole dozen of these if you were a legitimate locksmith. Um, but more recently, I'm pretty sure they have started to make leashy picks for like standard household locks. I don't want to call them household okay. locks, but just like standard locks that you can find in Bunnings. Um, I will see if I can dig up a video for those interested. Uh, they're super cool, but again, like decoders and things like that, I think would break people's minds to find out that these are just available to people. Yeah, there are people uh, in the chat who have gone and found some pictures of these pics and they're sharing them with everybody, which is really good so that we can get some like some more information for folks who aren't super into Locksport. Um, 
I think that there was one more question, and that's about how much time we have until we get some of the other folks on, on stream for the next thing, which is the open mic session. Um, where was it? Oh, yeah. What style of lock do you think would make for the most interesting game mechanic? Dimple locks. Dimple locks hand down, hands down. If you, can, if you could make a game around a dimple lock, like... I would pay good money for that. Like Sophie's safe cracking simulator is like $3. And that is one of like, I can't, I can't crack a safe to save my life. Um, but that was such a good, that was such a good value game. Like I would have probably paid $20 for that game. Um, and again, like if someone made just like a dimple lock picking simulator, um, I think that would be absolutely amazing. I think that would be the best thing. Um, I think also there are like bespoke locks like with detector mechanisms that I think would be really fun to see. Like uh, for those of you who are interested in detector mechanisms, uh, like the Chubb detector, which is like from decades ago and super easy to bypass now. But I think having those sort of things in like video game mechanics, if I found out any of those sort of bespoke things were were part of the gameplay I would just be like yes take my money take all of it um coincidentally if you ever make a video game with leashy picks in it please send it to me because I would love to play that awesome well um <laughs> that is all the questions we have and my dog is having a play with a toy in the background so that's probably <laughs> a good time for me to stop being MC as well um, but thank you so much for being here and sharing some of this knowledge about lockpicks with us because it has been a real pleasure to hear you explain it and nerd out about it. And I'm hoping that we get a lot of really interesting games out of this one. So thank you so much. No, it was, it was great to be part of the conference. So thank you for having me. And thank you for everyone who tuned in and, and asked questions. It was great to be able to answer them for all of you. <laughs>